Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prophecy Roundtable. I am so glad to be with you. I'm your host, Dr. Douglas Hamp. With me is Scott Harwell. You know, how do we get a theologian and a, and a lawyer? That sounds like a really weird combination, doesn't it? But it makes for a lot of fun, and we just like to have a good chat about the end times. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we're going to dig deep, and uh, we like to have guests that we agree with and guests we don't always agree with. Uh, that's kind of what makes it fun, that we get to uh, do a little ironing iron sharpening iron kind of stuff. Now, if you want to be part of this, you want to be a producer of this show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp. You can give as little or as much as you want. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Just got a new patron uh, today. I want to give a big shout out to uh, the couple that did that. Thank you guys. Really do appreciate it. I'll keep you uh, anonymous. Uh, do appreciate it though. Um, so check that out. And um, there's all kinds of great stuff happening. But today, our question is, what are the birth pangs of the end times? Are there birth pangs of the end times? I mean, yeah, there seem to be. But what are they? And to help us really dig deep, we have uh, back with us Joel Blackford. Uh, now, if you've been watching this show, we've had Joel on before. He's also a, uh, a very consistent uh, viewer of the show, and he always makes some great questions in the comments. And uh, so we're delighted to have Joel back on with us. So Joel, welcome again. Uh, Baruch Haba. We're, we're really delighted to have you. Uh, now, what part of the country are you in? I Minnesota. And it's Minnesota. Warm up here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure you betcha. Yeah. Aren't you guys, you you're, you really are for global warming in, up in Minnesota, aren't you? Oh, we love that. Oh, we want it to warm. Oh, we like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Well, anyway, uh, glad to have you back on. So uh, Joel, what are the end times birth pangs, uh, if any? Uh, kind of give us your rundown on that. What are your thoughts on that? And I'm looking forward to hearing what you think. So take it away, brother. Well, it's it's kind of taboo to talk about the birth pangs because in Christianity, we have a doctrine of imminence, which means nothing needs to occur until the rapture. And so most theologians and eschatologists, the people that study the end times, really won't touch the subject. They're afraid to, and, and they're almost chastised by their friends. So if you listen to Amir, he really will only talk about a few things like maybe the Gog Magog War, maybe Israel needs to be, uh, you know, people moving back to the land or needs to become a nation state, some basic things, maybe three, four points, that's it. That's all they're allowed. But other things are happening, guys. When you look around the world today, you see all sorts of things that you could call birth pangs. The problem is they're silent. There's And there's no prophetic people that you can count on, you know, because they missed 2017, they missed 2020. You you know what happened in 2020. And they all said, oh, it's going to be whatever, you know. And, and, and they really missed in 2020 not only the election side, but also the whatever thing that occurred in 2020 that was huge, the lockdowns, we'll call it. So the main thing is there are these signs occurring. They seem to be silent. We're not really allowed to discuss them because of the doctrine of imminence, which the three of us don't hold to, but others do. And so they'll chide you if you jump in and say, well, that doesn't really match with what my eschatology is. And eschatology is the study of the end times. And everybody has an eschatology, whether you believe you die and sit in the ground and rot, or if you believe in a premillennial or postmillennial or whatever it happens to be, amillennial, all these millennials, whether you believe in those types of things or the rapture or whatever else, everybody has an eschatology. The point is, can we discuss it and be friendly? Hopefully we can tonight. So my point is there is one prophet that was accurate about this, and that's Joseph back in Genesis, the son of Jacob. And he was shipped off to Egypt. Then he prophesied, or rather he interpreted Pharaoh's prophecy about the seven years of good and then seven years of bad, and he prepared for it. I don't see that happening this time around. I don't see anybody that I could count on to say we're seven years away or 10 years away or 20 years away. So the point is what we're doing, and I'm an aggregator, basically. I don't publish like an aggregator, but like John Haller is an aggregator. So he'll jump on every Sunday and give you the news that fits. And he tries to research everything. Well, we're running out of buckets to fill up because we have so much information right now that we're aggregating because the birth pangs seem to be popping off. So Joseph 
predicted seven years of good and seven years of bad, and it worked out that way. We don't know that, but we do know that things are increasing. Now, they seem random. And, and that's probably your argument back to me. Everything's random and I sell databases and I sell you know data and how we get things in as data and then the metadata that attaches to it. So you want to be able to file things properly. Well, in our situation, we don't know what they match because the birth pangs are listed in Matthew 24 and they don't really match up with what we're seeing. So let's go through some of the birth pangs listed and I'll just cite C.I. Schofield just because my dad would love that. So anyway, the main thing is Schofield says, you'll have famines, pestilences, persecutions, false Christs, and other things like that, international unrest, wars, things like that. So basically in the Greek, you're going to have, um, you're going to have uh, ethnic groups fighting ethnic groups. Then you're going to have kingdoms fighting kingdoms. Then you're going to have, uh, you'll probably have crop failures of some sort, then some kind of a plague, but normally plague would be the, the Greek word for plague, and it's loimo, loimos. And so in that case, it, it it's plague-like, okay? And then you'll have seismos, so you'll have seismographic issues. Uh, it seems like it fits into a pattern in terms of the first thing seem to be more caused by mankind when you have, you know, people fighting people that are their ethnic groups. That seems like mankind. But as you move towards the, the line, down the line here, pestilences, earthquakes, those seem to be God driven. And mm -hmm. so I'm arguing that we're seeing more. No, not earthquakes. No doubt about it. Earthquakes. I mean, are these bad. are things that Jesus himself D declared right so it's yeah, not this just is, this schofield is, right i mean right you quoted schofield and i don't hold to his <laughs> views anymore but he didn't get, he didn't get that wrong is i guess what i'm saying no he that, didn't okay okay just yeah, it's, it's hard to go wrong when you simply just quote scripture <laughs> that's always a good good place to go. <laughs> <It's free. laughs> in this case what are the right. birth things well let's read <laughs> yeah yeah so do you guys have any opinions about what you're reading there in the text are you seeing an increase in any of those things? Well, you know, those are, I think, difficult to determine because for a lot of these things, we've only started keeping good records. Let's call them scientific records, you know, in the last 100, 150 years for some of these things. So it, it's I, I would think it's hard to measure uh, accurately, scientifically. And I like to be scientific in these things, uh, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, what really happened in the 1500s you know were people paying attention were they bothering you know i don't know um but it but from my my anecdotal evidence it does seem like it and uh you know i was all over this stuff when i was still a pre-tribber back uh around 2008 i started doing a teaching called there will be signs and it was massively popular i mean people, people just loved it because i was sort of aggregating as well and i was giving all the amazing reasons why by golly, we're going to be out of here any second now. And man, it sure tickled people's ears. They wanted to hear it. They're like, Doug, come back in a month and give us an update, you know? And after a while, I'm like, I don't have anything much. I don't think else to say. Like, you know, it's the same basic stuff. And yeah, I think we're getting closer. But, you know, so then I was kind of forced to start looking for more spectacular type things. And, um, you know. I guess you can always find something, but, but, you but know, proving is another matter. Always, yeah. It's like going to a pre-trip conference and hearing uh, half, half the conference is on the pre-trip rapture as if people have not heard that the last 20 pre-trip conferences. <laughs> that they went to. Yeah. Or another, <laughs> I mean, another, yeah. Sign that, another sign that we're in the end times is people are stopped, you know, are not believing in the pre-trip rapture anymore. Like that's, that's actually a sign that we must be getting close because people are getting I didn't know that, but I guess. from the pre-trip rapture. It's amazing. <laughs> I was I was at a Jan Markell conference, and she's from Minneapolis, so it was easy for me to get there back in 2005 or 2006. And Jerry Jenkins was there, and he was part of the, the panel. And so at the end, they asked them the question, can anybody be saved after the rapture? And Jerry Jenkins looked at everybody and said, no. And he was booed. Jerry Jenkins, the guy that wrote Left Behind, he was booed basically off the stage. Okay, And now Jan purposely highlights that people can be saved after the rapture and whatever else. Point is... Well, how? That, 
How the Holy like, Spirit's removed, Joel. How's exactly, anybody going to get yeah. saved that's, by the Holy Spirit? Another, the Holy Spirit's a restrainer. Oh I mean, more than a I thought it was the Holy Spirit that convicted of sin. And if he's <laughs> out of here, which I'm being very sarcastic for anybody watching yeah. this in the future, the Spirit would be kind of God and omniscient and omnipresent and cannot be removed. Uh, 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 you know, that would be kind of limiting God. I guess he could limit himself, but, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh Hey, I will take the question right now. I Here's what I, I'm seeing. Compared to history, we're not seeing that many, at least right now on December 28th, 2023. We're not seeing that many uh, kingdoms rising against kingdoms, or and I'm going to call them nation states right now. There are two rather significant uh, current wars between uh a rather prominent Eastern uh, country in Russia and Ukraine, who has sort of aligned itself with the West, that could mushroom and expand quickly. We also do have uh, the nation state of Israel uh, currently in a war with one of Iran's Persia's proxies. That too, I mean, could, could escalate quickly into many nation states rising against other nation states. I mean, but again, we've seen that in World War One, in World War II. Um, I do think the next one will be the, the big one uh, when it does happen. What I am seeing as far as the ethnos versus the ethnos. Now, if we're going to look at that as ethnic groups, right. what I am witnessing over these past, really since Obama was put into place, and and with the policy, with the open borders immigration up into Europe and the open borders into America, they're creating this friction that's going to ultimately boil over. And what I see happening is a backlash. Sooner or later, there's a backlash where people have had enough of this nonsense. And I'm not just talking about the open borders immigration policy. I'm talking about the woke stuff, the girls can be boys, boys can be girls, the nonsense where you have to like dance around with what you say as far as your pronouns, where nobody has a sense of humor anymore and people get canceled for saying the wrong thing. And that's where I'm very, very blessed. I'm a small town local attorney. I don't work for a law firm. And if my clients don't want to hire me because of my biblical understanding or biblical morals, then okay, fine. I don't care. Uh, so I'm, I'm blessed in that respect. I don't work in the corporate world, but that's where I do see this, this tension in which I believe they want it to happen. It's, it's being caused intentionally where they're trying to pit somebody against somebody else, whether it's based on skin tone, whether it's based on politics, whether it's based on, you know, even, you know, various denominations. I, I see that starting to starting to heat up you know the bubbles are starting to rise on that it just hasn't started to boil yet so that that's i am seeing that being stirred so, so where would the birth pangs fit into your eschatology because jesus well, I spends think a whole chapter okay so scott thinks we're in them doug you're kind of on the fence or you want to squish them into the seven years but they're birth pangs no no i mean so i i would suggest you know, taking this whole idea of birth pangs, that you have your uh, Braxton Higgs, right? Right, Braxton uh, Higgs. Right, those birth pangs, right? So, like, there's kind of a lot of false birth pangs. And, hey, I'm not an expert, okay, because I never gave birth. But, you know, I, I have three kids, so I, I, know the, I know the basics of it, okay? And, um, you know, I mean, so, like, you know, pregnant nine months and getting bigger and bigger, and you know it's coming, right? It's not like you... The woman has no clue that the baby's coming, right? But then there becomes a point where we do start to enter in. And those Braxton Higgs can be can be very far apart from one another, and um, you know, and then they start getting closer and closer. So have you know the Braxton Higgs birth uh, pangs? Have those started? I would suggest probably yes. The question is, you know, how close and how intense are they? Uh, and, you know, I, I obviously by the time we get to the birth, it's going to be, well, super duper intense. Right. And I would suggest that the birth is the second coming. Right. That's what I would suggest the birth 
is. It's the second coming. All right. So, okay. you know, I don't think that we've gotten to the point where, you know, the mother has, you know, says, okay, let's get in the car. Let's go to the hospital. Uh, you know, she's probably, you know, the doctor says, you know what? Okay. You're not ready yet. There's no point in coming in yet. So why don't you just stay home and go for a walk? Well, you well, know, it's uncomfortable, but you're not quite ready to come in yet because you're not at, you're not in um, active labor. If I remember all these terms, it's been a few years. Okay, so that's that's what that I would suggest point, using our to metaphor. To that point it, it mentions it mentions an eth ethnos rising its eth ethnos kingdom its kingdom various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but these are merely the beginning of birth pains. And again, you know, I, I believe we're in these birth pangs. I believe they're rumbling, but it's like Doug just said at right now, it's not that painful. I mean, I never had a contraction before I've had, a, I've got a little minor hernia and, 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 you know, and I've had, you know, some, some, uh, I've never had a, uh, uh, what do you call those kidney stone? I've heard men complain about them, but right now, Nothing. 2020 was just, I believe it was just a little blip. I do believe it was sort of uh, the head puppets. Joel and I talked yesterday. The head puppets were just sort of floating out a trial balloon with this manufactured uh, uh, virus. And then seeing who would be com compliant in taking their state remedied solution as sort of a, like a test case. In other words, I, I, I don't have the mark of the beast. I'm more marked as someone who's definitely not going to go along with the agenda if we are in the end of the end of this age. And that agenda is going to be put uh, into place because if we keep reading, it says these are merely the beginning. The next step, if, if we look at this from a chronological standpoint, uh, like a birth delivery, the next step is they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations. I believe this gets us into into you know where you're having to take the mark of the beast in order to buy and sell and many will die by the sword some are destined for imprisonment and then all, this is also the falling away at that time many will fall away because their lives will be on the line it, it will be first century 60 ish ad when nero was saying oh you're a christian well say hello to my little middle pet lion named leo you know um it, 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 there won't be any probably false Christians running around when people start getting killed. I doubt there's very many false Christians in per, in Iran right now or, nor, or North Korea, places of that nature. Have you checked out sections of Africa lately over the last week and the amount of not, deaths? It's been horrible. Not in the last week, but... Oh, but, it's been bad. Very bad. Now, can I say that that fulfills that part of the prophecy? No, I think it'll be more worldwide, but it seems like that's ratcheting up. Sometimes these are first fruits or the first thoughts of it, and then it just magnifies after that. Haller kind of handles it this way in terms of when he handles the seals. He says they just keep on increasing and increasing alongside each other. And the word in the Greek for the um, the fourth horse is that they all come together and ride together, and they just keep on increasing. So... Um, if the seals are the birth pangs. Anyway, the point is certain things are increasing right now. Um, if you check out rice prices, rice is through the roof, guys. And rice is what most people exist on today. So from my perspective, I think it's important. And here's why. One, it, in April 8th of 2024, we expect to have a comet, not a comet, an eclipse, a solar eclipse, which is usually involving the Gentiles, at least according to the rabbis. Moon eclipses, lunar eclipses are going to be more for the Jews because they reckon by the moon. So anyway, the main point is that when we get to April 8th and all three of us are saying, no, you're not going to have a rapture on April 8th, why? Or they're going to say we're going into the Great Tribulation at that point in time. Why? Why are they wrong? Why are we right? You know, so guys, how would you explain it back to the people that you're not going to have a rapture in 2024? Well, <laughs> my, the big thing is I'm not doing anything until I see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the Hagios, the holy topos okay. location. OK, in other words, any and all these date setting prior to that time is sheer folly. I mean, we got a second witness in Second Thessalonians chapter two. And to Dr. Lane's credit, 
who we had on, he he does not teach eminence. He does not try to yes. twist. He does he did not try to twist his coming and our gathering cannot happen until the apostasy. And I've, I, again, you see that parallel with Matthew that many will fall away because of this persecution. And then Paul says, and when you see this, this man of sin, the son of perdition, and it, it specifically uses the Greek term for sitting and it does say naos. Okay. So, so I know the naos can mean one of three different things. So I don't, wouldn't want to be dogmatic. Paul is very particular. He could have used the term that only meant a brick and mortar temple, but it does say sit. It's going to be hard to sit in Joel's and Doug's and Scott's individual bodies as, as some people right. want to spiritualize this. I mean, in other words, so I do see now whether it's a tabernacle you know, does it have to be, uh, does the tabernacle or have to be set up on the Temple Mount? I mean, it was in Shiloh for 400 years. It, it wandered around the wilderness. Not, it wandered. It, I hate it. Israel was led around the wilderness by Yah for 40 years and the tabernacle moved with them. So, so again, Naos could be the tabernacle. And, and again, until until I see some of these signs, I mean, some people would say you're looking for something that may never happen. Well, again, there's certain things if we if we won't, unless we're going to allegorize and spiritualize away. And, and, and I do believe historicism has some value. I just think as a system, they put all their eggs in one basket and, and that basket blew up in 1844 when Yeshua didn't return. You know, after the 2300 day prophecy, I'm sorry, it just, it, it, you know, so they invented the investigative judgment to, to try to, to try to hold on to his, a classical historicism. And, and you just, it's, it's a combination. I mean, one of our listeners has some great, he pointed out to me that how long it would have been from, from when I think the, uh, the, the, the caliphate built the walls of Jerusalem up until I, I forget the year 2028. It's going to be 490 years. I mean, again, there is yeah. some validity. I, 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 our God can, can build in multiple ways. Prophecy can be fulfilled. There's a plaque on the wall um, that the Muslims set up in about 1541 that describes what they did, you know, and, and how they went from 1536. So it's Suleiman, the magnificent Salem's son, Salem one son. And he started the project in about 1535 and finished it in about 1543, about a seven year time frame. And then they put up a plaque and it's in Arabic, but you can read it to this day. And it states that he rebuilt the walls. And in, in some ways it sounds like Daniel nine, because it's like the streets and the trenches and the wall, you know, rebuilt and, and he sealed it for the Messiah, which is, um, uh, that would be Ezekiel 44, three. So, you know, only the Messiah can walk through that gate. So mm -hmm. the main point is mm -hmm. these things match up, but yeah. Okay. I'll admit, I thought that Yeshua might return in 2017 or that he might return in 2030. Guys, we're already, I mean, if you're a seven year guy like Doug and I tend to be, we're already through with 2023. It's not going to happen. Uh, now, um, so that brings us also to the other point that um, 2024, Scott, you have some friends that are predicting a rapture or something in 2024. Yeah, well, Craig Bong, I mean, we're, we're sort of Facebook friends and Craig Bong, he's been on our show before. He's one of the uh, anybody that wants to watch that. I mean, he, he's done some good research on King Charles, probably not as in depth as Tim Cohen did. But yeah, Craig, Craig was predicting the rapture because he has a kind of a. He's the only person that believes that the seventh month is in December. He was predicting the rapture at COP28, that King Charles was going to confirm the covenant with the many and that we would be out of here on December 13th. So now, you know, now he's backtracking on that. And there are some pre-trib people. They're more, most of the ones I'm seeing setting dates right now are setting it for next fall. The trouble on, here is that they keep coming up with a new date. And we so, know you know, Joel, you posed the question, why not 2024? Right. Hey, why not? you know, why wasn't it? Why wasn't it 1988? You know, what's great about 88? Right. I mean, there were so many things. Everybody had a number. Look, I think it's not wrong to have kind of an academic speculation about some of these things, but people take it way beyond academic speculation. They start saying, hey, I'm, you know, 99 percent sure there was a guy that was coming to our church and he, he had been following some dude online and they were absolutely certain that 
you know, the previous president was going to go into the Holy of Holies and declare himself to be the Antichrist and all this stuff. And that was going to, I don't know, it was like 2018 or 2019 or something. And I'm like, dude, you're going to have a, in fact, it was even 2017, I think. And he was like, freaking like two months away. I'm like, dude, it's not going to happen. And, and you're going to have egg all over your face. And he's like, nope, it's going to happen. Of course. Well, <laughs> guess where? Now we're up to 2024 here. And it hasn't happened. And this is where, you know, look, we're all excited about the Lord's coming. Um, but we've just got to stop. You know, we've got to stop predicting that the sky is falling today or tomorrow. We don't know. Is it going to fall? Yeah, it is. You know, Scripture says so. But but we don't know when it's going to fall. And, and this is where uh, when we start looking at the newspapers and we start saying, well, based on this newspaper clipping, you know, it, this must be that in Scripture. And guess what? It isn't. You know, I sort of fell into that back in 2005. I was so. 2005? I was, I was uh, 2005. I was so impressed by all the saber rattling by Ahmadinejad, the president oh, of okay. Iran at the time. You know, they were talking about destroying the great Satan and the lesser Satan, you know, American Israel. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, obviously he was you know, Persia, right? That's, sure. that's predicted to come against Israel. And they were working on uh, centrifuges and getting a bomb and all this different stuff. And you know what, it came and it went. And uh, boy, I was just, I was really thinking that was going to be it. But of course, then we had 2008, we had the financial collapse. Sure. I mean, we were within 24 hours of collapse. I mean, this was a really big deal. We tend to forget these things, but there was all kinds of talk saying that if we didn't have this, some infusion of cash, you know, what was it? Uh, 800 million. I mean, it was, or I don't know, is it 800, I don't know, 800 billion. It seems like such a small number compared to today's crises. You know, but but they just had to have this money in there because, you know, uh, Lehman Brothers had just, uh, you know, Bear Bank, whatever, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, all these had had collapsed. And we were just that close to the end to this financial Armageddon. I mean, it was crazy. Right. So that happened. Then we had Fukushima in 2011. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I was still pre-trib at the time. man. I was just looking up. I'm like, this is it, dude. We are like right there. And again, it all came and went. And we've just got to be really careful because we start to look like fools, you know. And then there was, um, what's the guy's name in 2011 that was predicting that May oh, um, 21st? Harold Camping. Harold, Harold Camping. Camping, yeah. Right. You know, I mean, he, you know, he got right down to the very day and that was going to happen. You know, lucky for him, he died shortly thereafter. He didn't have to deal with all the ignominy of, of all that because people lost their life savings in it, you know. So that's why I, I stay skeptical of these things. Like, do I think the Lord's coming? Of course I do. You know, do I know when? No. Have I you know, pondered into you know. academic explanation ex, uh, speculation? Yeah, but I have no idea. You know, guys, don't quit your job and don't sell your house, right? I really have no idea. So all we can do is take a look at scripture and say, hmm, okay, this is what we're learning. You know, and so we can kind of have sort of these ideas, but, you know, don't get yourself in a tizzy about these things. And, you know, if it's not 2024, they're going to come up with another date and then another date and then another date and another date. And like Scott said, until we see the Antichrist in that holy place, wherever that is, <laughs> we haven't arrived yet, you know. And so that's where we just got to be very, very careful. I believe, uh, the, and again, I believe that is we can. That is when we have some some excellent markers in Scripture from Daniel twelve, and a, and a second witness from Revelation uh, thirteen. And I, I personally believe Revelation eleven is parallel to thirteen. Doug, Doug believes it's before, but we still have these definitive time frames. Uh, which I believe are literal days. Not that is not a day for a year principle, as our historicist friends always want to say. Everything is a day for a year, except when it's not. And and so when when that happens, and again, I do believe these birth pangs before we even see that will intensify. I do believe there the, that earthquakes will probably go off the roof. There will be maybe a severe, like lengthy worldwide famine and and my spec I, i'll put on my speculation hat right now i be, i believe the puppet masters are going to cause that famine partially 
In other words, it's not just going to be from, it could be from Yah just saying, I ain't going to send rain. If Doug's theory is correct, there's going to be a three and a half year long famine prior to the great tribulation even starting out. If the prophets decide there's no rain anywhere. Well, the, the yeah. two witnesses. Yeah. It seems that like that's sense. what it says, right? It, yeah. they, they say it's not going to rain for three and a half years. And that's what Elijah did. Uh, you know, and so I think, again, a lot of the earthquakes and the famine, et cetera. And I think the, uh, the, the four horsemen or the seals are actually in part, not completely, but in part are caused by the two witnesses that are bringing these judgments in order to get humanity to repent of what they've been doing. Right. I, I really think the two witnesses job is to cause humanity to say, you know, Maybe we should rethink uh, our life goals. You know, maybe we should rethink our relationship with the creator. And uh, that's what God wants is he wants humanity to repent. He doesn't want to bring judgment. He wants, you know, like Nineveh to say, well, you know what? Maybe we should rethink our relationship with the most high creator and put on some sackcloth and, and uh, re, you know, humble ourselves. And, and so God was happy. Jonah wasn't happy, but God was happy that Nineveh repented. And that's what he desires in the world. Sadly, most of the world is going to reject that and, idea and they're and going to go to on with point, this illusion of grandeur and believe the lie instead of the truth. And he gave us these prophecies again. I think it is good when we can have healthy discussions, which sadly can't, does not happen all that often. I mean, we could have some preacher brothers over on here. I would tease them. I would vehemently tell them they're incorrect or that I believe they're incorrect. I would, we could argue about it all day, but it, it doesn't mean we, that I need to say they're not a believer or they're not a Christian or they're a fool or they're an idiot because a lot of these men are very, very, very smart. I just believe they've been taught up on a, brought up on a system. And once you're brought up in that system, it's much harder to unlearn what you've been taught than it is to actually start afresh and new and be and, and just read scripture for what it says. So you're right. everybody that adheres to the current dispensational pre-trib model, they will say, they will say that, nope, nope, I read this in scriptures. I'm like, no, you're not being intellectually honest with yourself right now. You heard this, you read it in a book, you did not just pick up scripture one day and come up with this nonsense. You, you didn't. I, I'm sorry. It, it's it's no one had ever came up. Maybe Darby sort of, but he was even influenced by Miller and Irving, and they were influenced by by Lacunza's work. So again, it's it's they were. You just trace where this came from. But these are smart men. I would never say John MacArthur is not an intelligent person, but he even teaches leaky dispensationalism in the pre-trib rapture. There are white spaces. Yeah. He'll, he'll at least, MacArthur will at least admit that there's no verse that Doug looked for when he became a non pre tribber MacArthur will admit you have to read between the lines. Right. <laughs> well, so will Hell Lindsay. Sure. Right. Um, Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye will admit it. I mean, these guys, if you press them on it, they're like, well, yeah, actually, it's all by inference that they hold to this pre trib rapture stuff. Um, you know, I had some random guy called me the other day and um i guess he follows me i don't know but he you know he's like yeah you know so the 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 rapture you know how he's like I mean, it must be like you know really really close and i'm like well where do you find a verse for the preacher of rapture and yeah, he couldn't find one you know and he started talking about this teacher or that teacher i'm like no no where mm -hmm. do you find the verse for the preacher of rapture and this is where he, every one of us if we're going to hold to such a massively life-changing doctrine, we really should know where that verse is. And, that's and it's what only life-changing you know. <laughs> if we're truly at the end of this age, okay? It has really been, an, it, it has been for the past 193-ish years, an academic discussion. Mm -hmm. It is all, and to sweep, I, I just had put up Sweet Peace question and it, it dovetails into the point I'm trying to make. So do you think everyone will know for sure when the yep. actual tribulation starts? Because if they haven't been raptured, they may think that no matter how bad things are, and I would go ahead and include the mark of the beast, that there are going to be some to go, this cannot be the mark of the beast because I'm still here. And they're so dogmatic on it. This is when it's no longer academic, will be 
during the final three and a half years of this age, if they're not raptured and they're still here and they're, they they can't get over what they've been taught. That's so you're when the it's smart not guys. academic anymore. Yeah, you're the smart guys. What are you going to tell the people? You know, they're going to say, well, I've been told we're in the Great Tribulation. Well, sweet peas right here. How are we going to know? How will you diagnose that, doctor? Well, <laughs> okay. So, look, I, I, I really do believe that the two witnesses will come on the scene. I think these will be two individuals that will be wearing some form of sackcloth. They will have supernatural, out-of-this-world abilities and they're going to have a message for mankind basically repent all right and um they will have the signs to go with it and i really do believe that is when many people in the church uh, will suddenly say oh my goodness god is real or miracles are real or god's power is real and i think we're gonna have a massive revival within christendom just a massive revival i think there'll be a lot of people who are not yet christians who will come to faith because they'll be like, huh, these guys are the real deal. You know, just like there were many, many, many Egyptians that said, you know, I think this Moses guy is on to something, right? And he just said that hail is coming. And I, if I'm we're, smart, I'm going to go get my animals and put them in the them barn, aside. you know, and <laughs> they did that. And they they saved their livestock. And the, the other guys are like, ah, eh, whatever, Moses. Well, they lost, you know. And, and so that's what I think people are going to start waking up, right? Um, now. Obviously, the, the two witnesses will be killed, and uh, it'll look like a huge, massive reversal, right? But I think we're going to have a lot of people that will come to faith before the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Let's call it the midpoint, you know, at least in my opinion, and Joel's as well, uh, of that seven-year period. Um, so that's, that's why I think we're going to be able to say, okay, something's really amazing here. And it's not yet the Great Tribulation, because that begins when the Antichrist, the beast, goes into that holy place and he then sits down in that place and he declares himself to be God and he shows himself to be God. How do you show yourself to be God? Well, you do something pretty amazing, right? How did Jesus authenticate, you know, his message? He didn't just go around and say, hey, I'm God, you know, I'm the Messiah. No, he, he did all the things that Messiah was supposed to do, right? So this is where uh, the beast comes in with all power and, and lying signs and wonders to to deceive the world. They didn't believe the message of the two witnesses. And so now they're going to believe the same kind of miracles, or at least pseudo miracles, I guess, uh, that the beast is going to do. And, and they're going to believe that because they like his message better, which is you can be a God. Don't listen to that stuffy old boring, you know, Bible God, dude. Yeah. Sex and uh, whatever you want to, and you yeah, know, you, yeah, do whatever you want. You know? Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's gonna it's gonna fit the times, and so that's how I think we'll really know. I don't think it's dependent on any kind of a rapture or anything like that. Uh, I think we'll just know. Okay, so we've got the eclipse coming up April eighth of twenty twenty four. Mark Biltz, he's a wonderful guy. I love him dearly. He has come out and said this is the jubilee year. It started a few months ago on Yom Kippur, and so he does the forty nine count. Jonathan Kahn does the fifty year count. I do the fifty year count. I don't know where you guys are on it, but the main 50. point is, oh, you guys are fifties. I am. Okay, okay. So the main point is, according to Biltz who does some good research that we have to have this start off during a Jubilee time frame, And that would mean now, well, nothing's happening, guys. And I don't think anything is going to happen during this time frame. Uh, but the rapture calls are going to happen. You will see the videos. Oh. You saw them in 2017. You saw these crazy videos. It's going to be a rapture. Sign in the sky. Rosh Hashanah. You know, the Virgo is reclining. They'd never seen it before. They thought that was the particular sign. Well, I've been watching Virgo recline for 15, 20 years. What? Well, Joe, let me ask you this now. And again, this is where I do differ with you and uh, and and Doug. And I would say probably 99% of prophecy geeks who have been indoctrinated, I'm sorry, kiddos, into looking solely at Daniel 927. And all you guys are looking for some dude called an antichrist to confirm a covenant with the many. And when there was no major political figure confirming a covenant this past fall, 
a lot of the people who were looking at maybe 2030, then just they, they did this. They took a big old X and just marked that off. OK, we can't be in the final seven years. And, and I know I'm not in the majority here and I'm not dogmatic on much, but I'm I am dogmatic on this. It was Yeshua's blood that confirmed the covenant with the many. And you've got to do three things to make that one verse in Daniel 9, 27 into a final seven year tribulation period. You've got to have a new he with no antecedent. You've got to have a new people with no antecedent. And you've got to have a different covenant. You've got to, you've got to manufacture a person, a people, and a covenant to make that the antichrist anti-messiah and that's why i brought up uh gavin I, I love you brother here. but i strongly just strongly strongly i know you, you, you take it, Doug. <laughs> i could too but i'd rather hear you <laughs> well I, I i know you do but that's why i brought up gavin 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 can't see that the harlot has been riding at least 1700 years he thinks there's going to be some harlot church seize control with this covenant with the many in 2025 and that, you know, the, the harlot church is then going to ride for three and a half years before the beast eats her. There's been a harlot church. If you ever do any research into Roman Catholicism and what the upper echelons really believe and what they did to believing Christians for a thousand years and kept people from ever reading the word, and she has not changed. She's done a good job getting Protestants to think she's changed. She has not changed. And until that entity gets gets what she wants, she's not going to give up. So Wait, she so I, I don't know why we go back to the church. I mean, I've shown in my books and on this show like a zillion times, you know, there's a cylinder seal from 2200 B.C., where Ishtar, Inanna, is riding on the back Roman of an Catholicism. It's not Roman Catholicism. Yes, it Come is. On. If no, you would ever not, dude. Do you Come ever on. study what Catholics really <laughs> believe? Okay, but but do you? you? Know, but it's but it's not Roman Catholicism. Do it's you ever the Babylonian study system Catholic? that that Roman Catholicism has adopted some of these things. I'm not denying that. I'm not against that. I'm not saying they're part of the problem. Of course they are. Mary, Queen of Heaven, Mother okay, of hold on, Connor, Chad, wait a second, co-mediatrix, wait a little okay, baby yes, sweet I know, Camus. Wait, but wait, <laughs> I know. Wait a second. But wait a second. Wait, hold on. So what do you do? Do I need to pull out that that uh, cylinder seal again to show you Ishtar? No. Okay. So what is that in you your got, opinion? Roman Catholicism is nothing but ancient mithril worship. goes all the way back to Babylon. goes all the way back to Babel. It just has a veil that people can't okay. see. It's okay. the same religion as my point, Doug. So we're agreeing okay. with each other. Okay, okay, okay. My point to Gavin is he thinks that this harlot doesn't start writing until the very final three and a half, first half of the final seven years. My point being, Gavin just should be thankful he didn't live in, in 1300s uh, Europe and want to believe the way he did. OK, he better be thankful he wasn't in 800 A.D. You know, unless he was part of the priesthood, he wouldn't be able to read the scriptures. This is an evil institution and they have not changed. They don't change. They're pro-life. And- They're pro-life. <laughs> and they really campaigned hard for me when I ran for office. <laughs> Wonderful people. I'm not talking about Roman Catholics, Joe. Okay. 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 I'm talking about the system i'm talking about what at the up uh, most roman catholics don't even don't even know ultimately what the doctrine is they don't really they don't necessarily agree with it but i'm talking about what comes from the pontiff oh okay so we're going to murder jesus daily the little piece of wafer and the blood literally become the body of christ and we're going to crucify him daily that's an abomination they're killing Messiah every day. But it's not an abomination of desolation. Right? No, I didn't say okay. it was. Okay. I said okay. it's an abomination. An ab- in your mind's eye. Okay. Well, no, that is, if you're trying to kill, re-crucify Messiah over and over daily, and you're literally eating his flesh, according to Catholic doctrine, transubstantiation. It's Trans- hocus pocus. It's, well, it's a The cult. Lutherans are consubstantiation. They're pretty close. They're, they're not much better. They're daughters of Rome. Okay. Ha, ha, ha.
it can it can certainly be tricky because many many people within the catholic doctrine the catholic uh doors are just amazing people and uh mm-hmm. and they have as much love for jesus as any one of us you know and I've, I've sometimes more not, <laughs> sometimes not, more not <laughs> so, saying not you know. <laughs> saying anything about roman catholics i know i'm I talking know. about at the upper levels but I, I'm just, uh, level, my point no, is, why limit it to the church? Why don't we just say that that the Babylonian system, which is ultimately false religion, sure. is something that has permeated the entire world? Has it been? Has it gone into Roman Catholicism? Sure. Has it gone into uh, Las Vegas? Yeah. Has it gone into you know your nightly news and TV? Uh huh. You know, and and she'll give you whatever you want. That's what's so amazing about Inanna. You know, are are you into the flesh? Great. Are you into money? Great. You into greed? Wonderful. You into power? Good. You know, she'll give it all to you. And she is the lure. Uh, you know, she's the worm on the hook. And and one until you bite the hook, you know, Satan's got to somehow lure you on that thing. But once that fish has bitten the hook, we don't need the worm anymore. She's just the worm to get everybody to bite the hook. I'm and I think that's why he's going to burn her because he's like, okay, everybody signed up for my little deal. And back Look, to your Daniel thing, you know, I, I again, we're, 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 we're allowed to, to agree to disagree, obviously, but I really strongly believe that that covenant is the covenant of death that is spoken of in Isaiah 28 and that people are going to make this covenant with death and Sheol. And they're going to think that they just made the deal of the century and that it's going to turn out great, but it's not. It's going to turn out really bad. And uh, and is even Israel is going to be part of that uh, deal. Uh, you know, woe to you, scornful men who rule this people in Jerusalem, for you say we have made a covenant with death, and we are in agreement with Sheol. Um, it's not going to turn out well. So I think that is the covenant. Now I know that there are people that are looking for the Abrahamic Accords or something like that. I just think that's all just, I think that's all nonsense. You know, I I think that's neither here nor there. Uh, We have to wait until this individual comes on the scene. And there is some worldwide crisis that Ronald Reagan was speaking of. You know, he's, you know, way back when he's with Gorbachev and he's just sort of uh, meditating on, chewing on this idea, you know, like, hey, what if we had some some uh, global threat from outside this world. You know, we'd forget how quickly, we'd forget our differences really quickly and we'd all come together in this kumbaya moment. And uh, we'd we'd agree on so much, right? And we see this in like movie after movie, you know, somebody's coming to destroy the planet and now we all rally together to save ourselves. I, I think that's what we're talking about. But in this case, who are the people coming to destroy the planet? It's the two witnesses. They're coming to destroy true, true. our yeah. way of life, yeah. right? And so now we need a hero. And this dude, Satan, just happens to show up. Hey, guys, I hear you need a hero, right? And he doesn't come as Satan with his pitchfork. He comes as your your uh, your local your local and friendly alien who's coming to save the day. You know, he he's coming to help. But uh, there's just this little little thing I need you to do, right? Just go ahead and just sign right here, uh, world. Just agree to my little covenant and we're good to go. And I'll get rid of these guys for you. Look at split, you know, so that's the crisis that I think is coming. And so I think a lot of these things are going to be um, brought about. They're going to be hastened, shall we say, by the arrival of the two witnesses. And here's what I would suggest. This is where I think we forget this all the time in eschatology is that God is the one on the throne. God is the one who's deciding when to open the seals, not Satan. Satan can merely set the stage and just wait for the curtain to go up. God decides when the curtain goes up and he is reacting. He's not pushing. He gets to react to what God is doing. And so there's a time when God the Father sovereignly decides, you know what? I'm ready to retake my planet. Okay. I'm going to take this thing back and I'm going to start un sealing these the the scroll right of course yeshua is going to take that scroll and he's going to start breaking those things open and when he starts to break those open satan's like oh crud this is it right and then satan sets his whole scenario in motion so that he can then try to counteract 
what is coming, right? He's on the fence. He's on the defensive, and he's got to find a way to somehow get humanity to not listen to the message of the two witnesses. He's got to get humanity to somehow sign away their authority, their dominion over the over planet Earth one more time. And I think that is the covenant with death and but, shale. And that's the covenant that he's going to confirm or strengthen with many. Okay, but you have that you have that happening at the beginning of a seven year period or in the middle. What the the the, co the, you're, the I, covenant? Yeah, you're, you're equating Daniel, and I put this up because no, Scott is not equating the covenant that Yeshua confirmed with the meeting in nine twenty seven with the covenant of death that Doug is referring to. I'm not denying what Isaiah says. I'm just not pulling it out of thin air from Isaiah twenty four and trying to make it fit Daniel 9 27 because earlier in Daniel 9 it mentions the covenant that's why I'm saying you're pulling from another book another prophet and inserting it into this and again Ribera did a great job as part of the counter-reformation inventing this as a system Lacunza did a wonderful job developing it which Miller then read Irving then read Miller, and then Darby read them. All this comes from Rome. I'm sorry. It does. They, the, the Jesuits, if you read their oath, don't take my word for it. Anybody listening to this right now, read what oath the Jesuits say. They invaded the Protestant churches. They're involved in the politics. And again, that's why I, that's why with Gavin, I so much I love Gavin, but I so much strenuously disagree with him because he can't see what's been happening ever since Constantine codified this evil religion that ultimately got worse and worse and worse over time. It was penalty of death under this harlot religion, not Roman Catholics, everybody who said, or I'm not talking about the priests down the street. I'm not talking about Grandmas are people raised in Roman Catholicism. I'm talking about as a system. When you study it and you understand what's going on, and if you ever, ever have seen the Vatican and the big old giant phallus symbol and all the satanic and occultic <laughs> goes all the way back to Babylon, things just make a pit stop. I, I want to do a tag team to, to Joel. Joel, I'm tagging you. <laughs> Give me a, so throw me a lifeline here, brother. So basically, <laughs> I, I view this as a Babylonian system. And so, Doug, I see where you're coming from, the Babylonian system and how it's played through the whole way. And it goes back to Nimrod and all those things. Sure. The problem is then John states there's Laodicea. And I would argue there is Babylon, which is wicked and is, it's corrupted. And you could say that certain Catholic leaders, you know, I could cite Malachi Martin and his Windswept House book and other books from Malachi and, and stating that certain leaders are right from the pit of hell in that church. But that would be the Babylonian system that controls them and maybe the elitists that control them and things like that. On the other hand, Laodicea, well, we, we should worry about our own churches, people. You know, um, there are some good churches. Doug, I'm sure your place is great. And Scott, you have a great place. But there are some churches right now that are just out of, they're crazy right now. And they remind me of Laodicea. They're neither warm nor cold. They're lukewarm. I think Yeshua would spit them out of his mouth. And he's saying, you know, you need to go repent and get some clothing that's clean and and some gold and, and we'll give you gold that's refined and so i'm thinking and and i am citing a person whether you like him or not his name is howard Pittman. he died a couple of years ago nice guy great testimony died had, no, i'm sorry near-death experience but he he cites the the church in many cases right now is laodicea and so babylon absolutely right on through the whole way through, you know, we just mixed them in with us. But Laodicea, for our the real believers, we're kind of drifting towards Laodicea. I'm missing what your point is there. So. There's <laughs> a lot to come out of right now. There's, there's come but, out but, of what, so, but Laodicea, I mean, what does that have to do with? So, so maybe I missed it. I don't know. Different people groups, different. There's okay. the Babylonian system, and you okay. have to leave Babylon. And okay. Babylon's going to be destroyed in the end. But okay. also, we have to be very careful that we're not in the Laodicean system either. 
because it's so okay. easy to switch into Laodicea. And Babylon's and Bab easier to see. You know, Babylon has daughters too, and that's my point. Well, in other words, I, I, when we start talking, look who who was considered a harlot in Scripture, in, in in the Hebrew Scriptures, it wasn't the Babylonians. It was not the Assyrians that were considered harlots. The harlots were were Judah and Israel. They're the ones that were the harlots. When we're talking about a harlot church, a harlot ecclesia. Again, what we have, and, 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 and I'm not upset, but what we have and what is developed because of what happened. In wait, wait, wait. AD, can I so, finish? Yeah. What okay. has happened is we now have, we now have where Yah is screaming to people, get out of bed with the harlot. Get all the way out of bed. To Joel's point, don't be lukewarm repent get get rid of all these all this syncreticism get rid god hated what god hated what jeroboam did no israel king ever repented from creating their own feast days from establishing their own priesthood and from idolatry when when he's talking about the harlot church he's talking about his people judgment is going to begin at the house of god that that is Christianity and and our brother Judah. That's what if you walk out of Babylon right into Laodicea, guys? That's what I'm arguing. You know, you may Babylon is easier to figure out. It's harlotry, okay? But what if you walk into Laodicea that's neither warm or cold? It it serves no purpose. Just spit it out. What if you walk into that? Uh, you you kind of want to be in Philadelphia uh, if you had your choice, or or Smyrna, although they get to go through ten days of tribulation, so. There are some good churches or, you know, <laughs> fellowships listed. So, I, 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 and I, again, I saw this on, uh, uh, to your point, Joel, I did see this, like 119 Ministries has a, uh, like a congregation or, how, or a house church uh, uh, finder, which yep. seven years ago when I looked on it, there was hardly anybody around Alabama. And now you look on it and it's like, ding, 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 ding. The, you know, if they would have done a screenshot yeah. seven years oh, yeah. ago oh, yeah. or, or 12 years ago, more and more people, we talked about it a little bit off air, Deuteronomy 4, more and more people who have been scattered and have been doing this mixture of religion. And again, and again I'm not talking about being saved people, okay? Faith, getting saved is the, is the baby step. In other words, placing your faith and trust in Yeshua. He died for our sins. It's only by his righteousness or we declare righteousness. I'm talking about that's where Christianity generally stops. I'm talking about read Revelation 2 and 3. Read what Yeshua is saying to the seven assemblies, to the seven churches, and really examine where you are as so far I, as what I want, I want to push back sense. a little bit, though, because... Um... You know, you, you really have you really have the competition between these these two women, right? You have Babylon, who is considered a harlot. She's a prostitute. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, this goes back straight to Ishtar, Inanna, the queen of heaven. That's literally what she was called in the book of Jeremiah. And of course, that's what Inanna literally means. It means queen of heaven. All right. So she was this, uh, you know, basically her 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 persona is this uh this young lady that's always available never gets pregnant right never becomes a mother and uh she's very cosmopolitan she's a woman of the world she's incredibly feisty she's very savvy she's also a um, a fighter you know she she's really good at you know i don't know martial arts or fighting or whatever you know but she she's a warrior right she's got a warrior uh she and and whereas whereas israel and judah more often than not i'm not saying always but most of the time they're considered an adulterous wife all right so you know obviously they're both committing a sin but there's a distinction between the two right a harlot just well she does what Harlots do, and an adulterous, adulterous wife is in a covenant relationship, and is now not being faithful to her husband. Where a, a harlot is not, she's not guilty of not being faithful because she's not in a covenant relationship, and that's really the big distinction. So you're saying so, Babylon's different than, say, Hosea with his wife Gomer, 
you're saying there's a difference there. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. again, I, I know your point, and I know that God certainly likens her, and that's why he divorced because she was acting like a harlot. I don't disagree with that, certainly. Yeah. Um, but you know, but I I don't I don't know that it's fair to say that well, let's call it Christianity, the church oh, let's is read, equal let's, to is equal to Babylon. Let's I, let's, I, let's let's you read. know that, that we that we might be um you know and I'll throw myself in this, okay. That that we might be sort of in bed with her, okay. Um, you know that we probably might, are a little. May may do some of the same practices. Okay, I'm not going to deny that either. But I, I would suggest that there is at least a fundamental difference between uh, Babylon as the the woman that rides the beast. And again, this is where I push back against the whole idea that the woman that rides the beast is Rome. Because I just don't think you're going back far enough. I do think Rome is part of the problem. So I'm not disagreeing with you there. But I, I really I'm not disagreeing with you is my point. Uh, well, fantastic. All and, roads just oh, make man, it. we're so no, happy. No, this let me great, say Scott. it. It's a all love roads, fest. Uh, all no, roads we're just so happy. Just Kumbaya, a, let, let, but, all you know. roads just make a pit stop at Rome. You keep on tracing it back through mm -hmm. through the Greek, through the through the Greek false religion, through the Persian Mithra through Egypt, all the way back to Babylon. Mm -hmm. But I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. His people are mixed in with this false syncretic sure. religion. I don't. And I'm that. sorry if Gavin <laughs> doesn't sure. like it. A <laughs> lot of what Christianity does is syncreticism. We're going to and have Gavin on so he can defend our script, <laughs> The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob hates a mixture. He has very specific instructions on how he's supposed to be worshipped, when he's supposed to be worshipped. And, and that is where Christianity says, oh, that's just for the Jews. And the three of us, now, we know better. Our eyes have been open to that. And I'm not saying drive the bus over Christians. You can share truth with them. I'm not saying, say, oh, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn in Babylon's plagues. No. But if you have been revealed this by the Spirit and you see this and you don't warn them, your blood, their blood, if we're in the end of the time, their blood is on your hands. If, if that's been your, your calling, to warn fellow believers, come out of her, my people, and you don't at least warn them about what the scripture says, not Scott's opinion, what scripture says, then, you know, I'm sorry, their blood is on your hands. Joel, you have something. Uh, my to problem add. is it's tough to define what Babylon is. Mm. Uh, you know, first physical Babylon, then spiritual Babylon, then daughter of Babylon, then the Babylon listed in Revelation 17 and 18 that seems to be New York City because it's sitting on waters and people are bringing gold and whatever else. And so I, I'm sitting on the fence with Babylon, guys. Sorry. I, and I can kind of smell it, but I'm telling you that the most tempting thing is Laodicea that you could walk out of Babylon just fine because you'll smell it. But Laodicea is interesting because it's neither cold nor hot. And what if places are basically Laodicea right now? I mean, it seems to match with our times. Hmm. Yeah, well, it, it I, just banned, it uh, I just you know. I just banned Gavin, my friend, because he's not going to lock me in with Hebrew roots that hates the church. I'm concerned about the church. I think we all. He, love he's, got, he's he's no longer allowed to comment if he's going to lump me in and say that I hate Christians because my my dad was a Southern Baptist. He never saw this. My dad is resting. He's going to get resurrected. So Gavin, kindly never ever ever join this program again. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of signs, there's another sign coming up, and April mentioned it, uh, which is you've got red heifers that were shipped off from Texas to Israel, and all the Christians are screaming, we want some red heifers slaughtered right now, and you only need one. And But you have to have clean people that would be sacrificing. It's, it's 
um, uh, number is 19. So it's Hukat, uh, that particular Parsha, and it's the red heifer portion. So the point is, we don't have those people. Now, I talked to Chaim Richmond when he came to Minneapolis years ago. He said, no, we've got the people. He doesn't. But he's going to say that he does. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, uh, it didn't go well for them in Leviticus 10. You know, uh, they went in and had strange fire and they died. Uh, well, the point is that you don't want to be slaughtering a red heifer if you're not a clean. That would be the term to whore in the, in the Hebrew, which would be ritually clean for that activity. And I'm not sure that we have any way to get that done. So I'm saying that you've got the, the eclipse coming up in 2024. You've got Mark Biltz predicting that we're in the Jubilee year. You've got the red heifers so that are coming due, supposedly, but there's no hard and fast rule with that. We do have the situation where some rabbis have purchased land on the Mount of Olives that overlooks the Temple Mount, and and they have a location where you could slaughter, and and we still have the cleanliness, the Tahor issue, where you can't get across from the Mount of Olives without going through, you know, a lot of graves, and <laughs> that would contaminate anything. So I don't know how you resolve that, but I'm seeing that you're going to get some screaming occurring as we move forward, and I, I was going to give you some other notes, but I'm not going to other than this, I'd like to state that there are signs in the sky coming up in 2025. We will have two blood moon eclipses in one year. And they're pretty rare, guys. The main thing is I've been doing some additional research on that. And 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 so when you look at the Greek in uh, uh, Revelation 6, 12 through 17, when you look very, very carefully at it, you'll see that you have two things occurring in the skies at the same time. You've got a blood moon eclipse because it is holo in the Greek. So you know it's a full moon eclipsing and it's almost a full moon tonight. And then on the other hand, you've got the sun that turns black like sackcloth, sakos in the Greek. So it, it is like sackcloth, but the main thing is if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that it's layered goat Hairs. And a man by the name, name of Ben Davidson, a great guy uh, from Suspicious Observers, has come up with a theory that there will be dust that accumulates on the sun over time. And within the next 20, 40 years, you may have something called a micronova, where the sun would go from its typical yellow to more of a whitish color to then a red. When it goes black, which is listed in Revelation uh, 6, then you would have a micronova and it would literally explode us back into the Stone Age. And if that occurred, whenever it would, that would change the whole world. Uh, it would be like an 1850s. Isn't the event. sun on fire? Yeah, but for some reason, it's so how do you get dust, dust on the sun? I don't know. I mean, it's scientific. Yeah, I'm pretty darn skeptical it, of that one. How it's about. Many, many how about times. The abyss is going to open up, and there's well, going to be a lot of smoke coming out of the abyss, and it's going to cover the sky, and so we can't see the sun, so it looks like it's covered with sackcloth. Well, and does... the moon at the same time is going to be blood red. That's where I really disagree with Mark Biltz, because I remember very strongly in 2014 and 2015, <laughs> oh my gosh, we had the lunar eclipses. Oh, yeah. da, da, da. Cue the In music, sequence. people. Drum roll, please. This was it, man. And of course, I heard all the same garbage that, well, this is pretty darn important. And of course, you know, if it's a blood red moon, this is significant for Israel. Whatever. It's the whole blood, the whole reason that the moon turns blood red. I've seen a blood red moon yep. and it has to yep. do with dust. Okay. When I lived in Southern California, there were a lot of forest fires. And every time we had one, I looked up at that moon and I'm like, well, that's funny. Why is the blood the moon blood red i'm like oh my gosh it's the end of the world and then i realized i'm like no it's just a forest fire all right and and so and and go back if you guys want to check it out look at pictures of iceland don't ask me to pronounce the name of that mountain or that uh, volcano but when when uh that thing was spewing out its ash and you looked at the sun guess what you didn't really see you didn't really see the sun okay so there's your answer it's right in the text for crying out loud, it's right in the text in Revelation chapter 9. And, and this is where we have to understand that the, uh, the, the, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are very much overlap one another. 
And, and so they're they're adding details to one another so that what you have in the fourth trumpet, where you're going to have this star that falls down out from heaven, and then in the fifth trumpet, and I saw a star having fallen from heaven, and he had the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened it, and smoke came out like a great furnace, and the sun and the moon were covered, right? That's the same thing that we have in the uh, the sixth seal, right? That's going to happen right there. And that tells you something, that we're talking about the same basic events, right? So these are very much overlapping kind of things, and we don't need to speculate there's going to be dust on the sun. That's just got to be the dumbest theory I've ever heard because well, actually, that know. happens frequently. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Galleries. Okay, go, Scott. I, I just want hey, hey, and and again, I believe Doug. And here, here's where we do have a similar understanding as far as the seals. In other words, when the sixth seal opens, I think you would agree it couldn't be just like a one day, 24 hour event because sure. it does say the kings in the earth. Yeah. They are hiding. They're gonna. They're gonna go. Okay, let's go to our underground bunkers. Let's go. You know, Zuckerberg's gonna go to his new compound on Hawaii, I guess. But then, <laughs> Thank then you, at Scott. the very, Thank you. at the very end, at the very end, we see the kings of the earth gathering against Jerusalem. Yep. So, so apparently, there there has to be. I believe just like the first seal is opened. And it never really closes in the second seal is open. So I believe the sixth seal is 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 unfolding, not just in it's not going to be like a 24 hour period. It's got to unfold. I agree. Time. Sure. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, so, it can't so, just be like a bam. Yeah. And it really I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think the seals are the things that let's call them stay open the longest, if you will. Uh, because, look, once we once we get to the seventh seal, it is over. Right. And that's what it actually says in the text. If I remember correctly, it's over. Right. And so in the sixth seal, a lot of stuff happens. Right. You've got every mountain and island moving out of its place uh, in case people to get the memo. That is epic. Right. That is end of the world kind of stuff. Right. That doesn't happen uh, very often. It's not going to happen ever again. And the sky is going to recede like a scroll. That's a big deal. And then, as you just said, that, you know, all the tough guys on planet Earth, they're running for the hills. And that does take real time. And this is where I think uh, a lot of eschatology teachers have gotten into trouble because we just we put it into a into a chart or, a, you know, and something like that. And it's easy because we got our little charts and but you got to put this into real time. Right. And that's what the beauty of actually writing a fictional book forced me to take it off the charts and put it into real time. So I had to imagine like, okay, what's this going to really look like when people are involved? And, you know, you have to you have to travel from one place to another, you know, and, you know, sure, Jesus could snap his divine fingers and it would all be over, but that's not how he rolls. You know, well, he's going to do things in real time as well. Well, you, where are you seeing, because I, I mean, I pulled up when you said seventh seal, Revelation 8, 1, when the lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, seven trumpets were given to them. And so where are you seeing that the seventh seal means it's over? Like where in the text? Because I, I, I have I've been studying Revelation a lot over the past month and I, I don't see I see that when the seventh trumpet I think that's revelation. I would go seven bowl. So, okay. So it yeah. says, um, <clears throat> angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. All right. So if you, if you trace that, you'll see that it's the same thing that's going to happen in revelation eleven nineteen. The temple of God was opened in heaven. The okay. ark and the covenant okay. was that's seen. That's lightnings, noises, thunderings. Okay. Revelation 16, 18. There were yep. noises, thunderings, lightnings. Oh. Right. So, the reason so yeah. Go ahead. Let me, the reason I ask is because it said in Revelation 11, this is after the two witnesses, and it talks about the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded. So, this yep. is the seventh trumpet. And there were yep. loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Right. So, so that's I, I I personally believe that the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, would be the Yom Trua that Doug and I we actually agree on on, on that that we're talking about Yom Trua, the future resurrection, and then the bowls are poured out, uh, the bowls of wrath are poured out over the final ten days prior to Yom Kippurim. 
Joe, what's your what's your uh, how, what's your Scott, take? You're driving me crazy because you brought up Moadim. Remember from Daniel <laughs> 12 last? You know, on Moed, 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 or Mo, Moadim. It's Moedi, Moadim, and then Kotsi. And and I think Steve brought that up too, Motria. So, Kotsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the bottom line is, what if he sets things up to go Moadim to Moadim, you know, or Moad to Moad? So it, whatever Moad it happens to be, there are seven. And, and I, Sabbath is a Moad, but it's not that kind of a Moad. But it seems like he's setting it up to be times, and that would be almost a year time frame from Moad to Moad. And, and yeah, I've, I've been deliberating that since I heard that on Monday. And I have notes in my Bible that I've deliberated it 10, 15 years ago. But it makes more sense now that you have to have some kind of set time frames when things occur. Why not kick it off with yearly moeds, you know? And so, anyway, getting back to my original point, which is people are going to be coming to us. And they're going to be saying, weird things are happening and we're supposed to be the experts, and we're not really agreeing, and we don't have to. But but we should be able to help people settle down. We're not in the Great Tribulation, even though 2024 is going to be bonkers, guys. And 2025, uh, I see some interesting signs in it, you know? Um, oh, I didn't mention it very well, but Ken Johnson has said that's the Essene Jubilee year. So Bill's the same 2024. Ken Johnson is saying Essenes have it right, and that's going to be 2025. Let's look at them and see what happens. And I would have never guessed 2025, guys. Not a chance. That just didn't work with all the research. It's a silent time frame. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're out of time for today. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, hey, you know what? If if it all it starts in 2024, man, I'm delighted to eat humble pie. I really am. If it starts in 2025, I'll eat humble pie in that year, too. But, you know, I'd rather be skeptical uh, and maybe be wrong. Uh, you know, it starts sooner than later. But I guess I'd rather be skeptical than to just say, well, yeah, I guess I changed my whole life and it didn't come to pass. So, um, you know, but you're going be careful. to have to answer the questions regardless. They're going to come, guys. Well, yeah, I, every Tuesday I take questions. <laughs> so if anybody has other questions you want, uh, I, the same channel, I take your questions and I'm going to be a frenzy it. this time when they come. <laughs> the, the, the only thing I've done since 2020 different is, and nobody would have ever thought I'd done it, I did get some chickens and some goats and I, and, and I can now grill a garden. I've proven to myself I can do it, but I'm definitely, I'm already on top of what in Alabama is considered a mountain. So I'm not going to move to the top of a mountain. I already live there, but definitely, uh, even though I do believe we're the end of this age, no one should, should necessarily make any different plans other than I do think it's regardless of that. I think it's going to not be a good place if you live within the cities in the very near future might want to consider moving out to the country. But the big thing, and I'll harp on it one more time, in spite of my brother, and I love him dearly, Gavin Finley, the key is repentance. That's what that's what this entire book, that's what Revelation is for. That's why God gave us the prophets. The prophets, yes, did they, get, did they speak of end times events? Yes. But the main role of a prophet, and Shalom asked this question earlier, where I saw the main role of a prophet is not to predict the future, is to call his people to repentance, period. And, and it's not a very popular role, and it tends to sometimes irritate his people within the church. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that I'm a commissioned prophet from God, but we do have different giftings and different callings. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm probably the worst evangelist ever, you know, <laughs> as far as... <laughs> I should work on that. You know, I should pray to be a better evangelist, but, but, you know, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with people, I, I can be actually quite, you know, I don't bite or anything, but, uh, but, well, you, that's know, good to know. Yeah, but, but we're, but you we're do have we're pet a, peeves. <laughs> Just we're, we're, in a, we're, in public, we're in a public <laughs> forum here. And, and this is my passion for his people because of where I do think we are. And, you, and, and whether or not we have a thousand more years, we could all be daily walking in repentance and coming out of this okay. worldly system. Sure. Friendship yeah. with the world is is to be an enemy to God. Mm. So, Amen. 
Well, on that, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, share this with others. Again, if you want to become a producer, go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp, and you get to choose what you want to give, but it all helps. Thank you. Big shout out to uh, the producers and to the patrons already. So thank you guys. Uh, if you have other questions and you want really want me to dig deep into those every Tuesday, I take your questions uh, right here on this channel. You can also put your questions in the app for The Way Congregation, The Way Congregation, available at Apple and Google. Uh, so check that out. And uh, and if you're in the Denver area, man, come join us. We do Shabbat together every Shabbat, every Saturday at 1030 a.m. in Lakewood. So check that out at thewaycongregation.com. God bless you guys. And until next time, take care.